A very good afternoon to all of you. I am Ankita from Nascom. I am back with the twelfth episode of our uh, product management series. Today I have with me Shamir Ayappan, Director, Products Adobe, who will share his knowledge and expertise on a very interesting piece, which is from product managers to general managers. Two more things from my side. You can ask questions anytime during the session. Shamir will cater to them as on an as and when basis. Plus, uh, do not forget to leave the feedback to help me better my future sessions. Over to you, Shamir, and welcome, Shamir. Hey, thanks, thanks, Ankita. I'm hoping all of you can hear me right. Uh, let me just collapse this. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And as Ankita said, I'm Shamir Ayyappan. I'm a director of products at Adobe. Um, and I've uh, maybe a quick introduction about myself. I've been at Adobe for close to 13 years now. Um, all through, I've been in this product management role and then also, uh, you know, taken on some of the other additional functions. Prior to this, I used to work for um, a mobile data startup called July Systems, which has since been acquired by Cisco. Prior to that, I was a um, professional services consultant at uh, Bellcore Labs. And prior to that, I did my MS from Penn State, and I've also got an um, executive MBA from IM Bangalore. So that's a little bit about me. Um, so um, in this um, function, um, and I mean the reason, so in my role over here at Adobe, I actually work for a um, um, small BU, uh, small business unit that manages our e-learning, e-books, um, web conferencing, and um, rapid app development platforms. So we have product lines in these. It's um, about a $200 million uh, portfolio of products that I manage. and the interesting part about this is that um, we basically manage the entire worldwide business for these product lines from this office in Bangalore, which is sort of unique um, to most companies um, in India um, in that um, you know, most organizations are either managing a business that is local to uh, this region or are um, you know a sub function or a subunit of a larger uh, business that is based out of um, US or Europe etc um, so in that way we are very unique and I'll touch upon more about that as we proceed through the session and how that's influenced um, you know um, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk to you about. So um, the reason I chose this topic is because I myself am on this journey from a product manager to a general manager. And what I'd like to do is share some of the interesting insights that have garnered during this journey. So I'd like this to be a really interactive session. Um, I have a few slides to keep me honest as I'm telling the story, as I'm narrating the story, but feel free to jump in and ask questions and clarifications wherever you uh, need them. So uh, quick disclaimer and let me move on. So um, what's really helped me understand the challenges of a GM is that as I um, grew in, in this, um, role at Adobe um, from a PM to being a business owner to assisting um, my boss, the GM over here to manage different functions. I started getting some insights on, you know, some of the unique challenges to a GM. If you think about it, there are not many functions in an organization um that are called upon to play both or to think about both the long term or have both the long term and short term goals 
most functions either focus primarily on the short term or focus primarily on the medium to long term goals. A GM has this unique responsibility of balancing his or her time and resources between the long term and short term goals. And I think that's a really unique challenge, a really interesting conundrum that you're placed in. Let me tell you a little more about you know what I mean. So if you think about you know typical functions that uh, we are familiar with, our own functions of product management, or be it our counterparts in marketing, engineering, these are functions that really think medium to long term. Whereas functions in uh, you know like sales, customer success, etc., they think more short term. Again. Let me walk through what I mean in those. So as a product manager, and this is a function that you know most of you in this session are familiar with, in this function, a PM is responsible for um, identifying um, the next blue ocean, right? Um, you're looking into the horizon to figure out where are your um, next big opportunities for growth, um, for exponential growth, um, you're identifying um, these opportunities that are opening up that can be addressed in a meaningful manner uh, where you can have sustainable differentiators over your competition and drive um, you know, significant profits. Um, but by the time you build and get to that, that's again something that you're going to aim for the medium to long term, right? Similarly, um, in a marketing function, um, um, having worked with, um, um, if you worked with, you know, your product marketing counterparts, they are tasked with building a brand, right? Um, it's really like steering a ship, marketing, product marketing. It's really like steering a ship. It's difficult for you to change direction overnight, right? You, they are tasked with building a brand. They're building a brand out. They put out a marketing plan for you know the medium term, where um, they've got a strategy for building out what the brand perception should be over this period in time. Be it through um, you know banner ads, be it through um, Google AdWords conferences. Uh, placements in 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 other um, collateral, etc. But they have a strategy for building a brand out over a medium to long term, and that's how they function. So these are typically functions that are focused on the medium to long term. Now, if you contrast this with functions that are focused on more uh, the short term, these are functions like sales, sales. Um, a salesperson will not, you know, move a finger if it doesn't help meet her quota um, for the quarter. Uh, the salesperson is structured in such a manner that, you know, 50% of that pay is variable and that pay depends on them meeting that quarterly number. So obviously, you know, they, I mean, the entire function is structured to function like that, to meet those quarterly numbers. That's their responsibility, that's, that's their KPI, and that's what they work towards. Similarly, customer success and support. These organizations, customer success more and more today, um, they are responsible for bringing in the renewals. They are the customer advocates. They need to keep, they need to do whatever possible to make the irate customer happy immediately. You know, that's this renewal that's coming up. You can't have an irate customer during this point in time. There might be a ER um, enhancement request or a bug that needs to be addressed to get this uh, renewal in. And that's what they're gonna push for. That's what they're gonna try and get done, right? Because that's their goal. That's what their goal done. Now, like I said, in this, um, in this 13 year journey um, from a PM to a business owner, I've assisted um, my business unit GM in running several of these functions from sales to support, to marketing, to 
customer success, to support, to evangelism, managing our community. And I've enjoyed each of these stints and garnered several insights that based on which I, I really believe it helps a PM make holistic business decisions. Um, you know, it's not just about, um, we really talk about, you know, PM being uh, the owner of the business. But I mean, if you're going to be the owner of the business, you really need to think of all the facets that impact that business. And managing these functions have helped me um, do that, have helped me um, grow into a role that, um, you know, from that I can confidently make those holistic decisions. Um, any questions so far, Ankita? Uh, let me just have a look. Uh, no questions, Shamir, so far. All right. So um, let's move on. So at this point, what I'd like to do is walk through how, um, you know, some of these functions actually help in us making those holistic decisions as a PM. So I'm going to look at um, some of these functions from a PM's lens and see and talk to you about the insights that I gathered uh, managing those functions that help me make the right PM decisions in, in my product, in my product lines. So um, starting with sales. Um, so the insights that um, PM can garner from sales, right? So when I started managing sales, the big things that um, you know I had to figure out was where is our revenue coming from, right? Um, which are the channels that are working for us? Um, is it our um, partner channels? Is it our um, direct um, Adobe channels, um, Adobe field sales channels, or is it our um, online e-commerce channels, et cetera. So we had to figure out which are the channels that are actually bringing in the business. Similarly, um, you know, we were looking at what are the SKUs that are functioning well for us? Um, you know, the way these are packaged, is it, um, you know, is it my subscription SKUs that are uh, working for me? Is it my perpetual licensing SKUs that are working for me? Um, that was the other thing that we had to look at. Um, you looked at verticals, you know, which verticals are bringing the business in? You know, are you doing better in government or education or healthcare, et cetera? So these are actual numbers that are coming in uh, day day on day. I mean, you have these insights, um, and it's up to you to review and see which of these functions um, have the most impact, which ones are growing the fastest, which ones can you influence the most. So as a PM, when I'm planning a new version of my product, this is key input for me. I look into, okay, I'm planning this new version, what is it going to impact, right? Obviously, my Uber goal is to drive revenue growth, right? I mean, any product update, any new product that I come out with, I obviously have um, a revenue impact that I need to make with that. Now, so I start, because of the sales engagement, I start with the basics in terms of, okay, these are the channel skews, verticals, et cetera, from where it's coming in which has the biggest impact, what can I influence the most, this new update that I'm planning to come out with, which one do I realistically believe it will influence or which one should I try and influence, which one should I try and impact. So that helps me make the decision, right? I mean, is it subscription, for example? If it's subscription, um, you know, you possibly want to make more um, smaller but more more frequent um, product updates. If it's perpetual, you probably can make more longer term, um, hope, you know, uh, more um, well-rounded product updates. So there are back, um, there are um, uh, decisions that you make based on 
which ones are working out for you. Um, similarly, you know, where is your business coming from? Is it um, is uh, most of your business coming in from renewals? Is it coming in from uh, from new businesses, new customers that you are acquiring? Is it coming in from um, maintenance and support? Is it coming from coming in from royalty? Again, any product updates that you make, you would look into things like this. Um, you know, if a bulk of your business is coming in from renewals, then you you know you want to keep thinking about what is it that you're going to do for your existing customers and that's going to be primary you know what's this what's in it what's in this new update for your existing customers unless there's something meaningful for your existing customers they're not going to renew but if bulk of your business is new business then you really don't have to think of that because um you know they are going to look at the entire offering and not just at the incremental delta that you added in the update. So those are things that you would look at. And all of this is input that you start with first from sales because you want to look at the numbers and say, okay, this is where I will have the most impact on in terms of numbers. And that's the one I want to focus on. So we start making our um, pitch from there saying this is the um, area I want to focus on and this area, I mean, this new update will impact that particular area. So that was the insight on sales. And again, feel free to stop me at any point if you have questions. Uh, I have one, Shamir, now. Shall yeah. I? Yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Question is by Amit. He's saying product manager has the reputation of saying yes to only must have features in the product and fanciful ones are a no. For a GM, the sales and customer facing teams report the needs of fanciful customer uh, feature to win the order in quarter. How you tackle it? Yeah, I mean, so that's really a pertinent question. And like I said, I think that's the balance that you need to figure out, right? Because um, like Amit really pointed out, from a GM's perspective, um, a bulk of the time the GM spends is with managing the quarterly numbers, is with managing whatever is necessary to hit their annual targets. And that comes from sales. Um, that comes from customer success. And um, so that input is crucial in terms of how you balance out um, your resources between you know what's being worked on in the short term to the medium to long term. So um, I'll just pause and address that question itself in terms of how we are addressing it over here. So what we've done is um, as we started growing, we've had multiple ent large enterprise customers come in and when you have pressures from large enterprise customers these get you know i mean they can't be ignored and these are short term enhancement requests short term bugs that have to be fixed etc and they need to be addressed um but they need to be addressed by the same team that is building out your medium to long term vision for you as a PM, right? So what we've done over here is we've consciously acknowledged the fact that there will always be these pressures. So we've divided our team in such a manner that we have a certain portion of our team that addresses the short term needs, the immediate needs of our existing customers, the immediate uh, fixes or ERs that are coming in from our customers, while another segment of the team focuses on the long-term goals. So we've we've actually bifurcated our resources, consciously saying that we will have 50% of our resources focused on um, the PMs, on building out the PMs' medium to long-term vision. We have 25 to 30% of our team working on building out the ERs and addressing any bugs that exist um, that come up that need to be addressed you know in so we basically have updates every two weeks so we can get these rolled into those two week updates 
and we have the other 25 to 30 percent of our team working on scalability and reliability that's what we do because as the product grows we've realized that we need a segment of our resources focused on you know um re um you know continuously re rebuilding i don't want to say re-architecting but rebuilding this for scalability and reliability and that's what we do that's how we function okay um, yeah, Shamil, um, I think continue. All right. So um, the next one was, what are the insights that we can garner from, or, or the insights that I've garnered from managing um, our customer success teams and our support teams? So again, this is um, a short-term focused function, right? Um, the customer success teams are responsible for um, bringing in your renewals, are responsible for driving your ARR. They are your customers' advocates inside your organization. Um, so they, so uh, out here in our view, we've consciously um, got the customer success teams, the support teams, co-located with our engineering and product management teams because like I said, we have these bi-weekly updates that we do uh, do to our product lines and we truly believe that we can establish this feedback loop from the customer success teams back to our product management teams and engineering teams so that um, you know we, we are really following this um, um, you know, the build, measure, learn loop that you might have seen in our, uh, you know, in Eric Rice's Lean Startup Methodology, et cetera. So we truly follow that. Um, the build out um, the, uh, the basic version of the product, we get it to market, we see what the feedback is, what parts of the product are being adopted at first, um, you know, how is the product being used? Um, we have a um, significant amount of um, data um, that is gathered on the usage of the product. And based on that, we go back and build and iterate again. And this is stuff that we've got from working closely with the customer success teams because they are the ones that know uh, the measures that they use they are on top of you know what part of the product is being adopted what else do we need to push out to the customer to drive adoption in more depth um you know what are the use cases the customer is using the product for um it even helps us discover new use cases that we possibly didn't think of when we rolled out the product and then you know um, and then build further based on that and build out to build the product out to meet those new use cases that the customers introduced to us. I truly believe that a PM should be measured on feature adoption because the rest of the organization jumps in and spends their days, months, years building out the feature set that the PM asked them to build out. So if they're gonna do that, and if they're gonna follow the PM, I think the PM should be measured on whether that feature that was finally built out, well, at least the marquee features that were built out, whether they were adopted and, you know, to what extent was it adopted. So that's that's a metric that I use for our PM team here. And we basically iterate over and over to ensure that, um, you know, the adoption of those features are increasing, be it either in terms of, um, features that um, we continue to tweak or be it, in, I mean, if we realize it's documentation that's missing or if we realize that we can, you know, lean on marketing or lean on the evangelist to train these customers better on that particular product, et cetera, we figure out all those and then get that done so that we can drive adoption of that um, particular feature set. So through this, what I've learned is to, um, you know, as a PM is to 
plan for um, um, you know customer education of the product, right? Um, to plan for um, what is it that I can add in the product or documentation to make life easier for my customer success team, for my support team. All of this thus ensuring um, you know I improve my overall customer satisfaction with the product. So um, this, um, I mean, really embracing the build, measure, learn feedback loop is something that um, you know I've um, yeah I've sort of inculcated from managing the um, CSM and support teams. Any other questions? Uh, yes, Shamir, I have one by Dinesh who's asking, how can we measure? on features which are already in use and we have just improved them. Okay, um, I'm guessing you're talking, so basically what we do is features in use, we look at what the feature adoption was at a, you know, at a particular point in time. And then before we improve it, right, I mean, we have a hypothesis the pm has a hypothesis on what part of this is it going to impact um so if, you know this new um update that you're rolling out what part of it is it going to impact is it going to drive further adoption of this feature in a certain manner is it going to drive further adoption of this particular feature by this customer segment so we have a hypothesis on why you know, you have a lower adoption or why you believe you can drive adoption by this enhancement. We go ahead and build the enhancement and roll it out. And then we again measure it to see whether the adoption of that feature, whether the usage of that feature has increased. And that's how we measure it. Thanks, Shami. The impact of the release. Okay. Yeah, sorry, sorry. anything else, Ankita? Uh, oh, nothing. Thank you for this uh, right. answer. We can see further. Sure. All right. The other one is moving on to marketing. Um, so the insights that I gathered from working with marketing, and this again is pretty significant. Um, so we have, again, like I said, we have the entire um, marketing um for our products managed out of here both you know product and field marketing managed out of here while we do have you know field marketing reps in the us europe etc we have our sales team members in the us europe etc all of those are managed out of this office so working with them uh from here has taught me a bunch of things in terms of how we plan out our product starting from you know how do you how do we plan meaningful marketable releases right uh, meaningful marketable product updates um how do i you know how do i package um similar themed updates together so that it can be meaningfully marketed so i can prioritize that under a certain theme under a certain bucket um in terms of my new product update that I'm planning to roll out. Um, so that's something that we look at. Um, things like what can I add in the product to market or communicate with the customers better? Um, all of us realize that, um, I mean, as we you know, move more and more into a subscription or ARR model, it's, it's super critical to be able to communicate with your customer um, and many a time, the the most efficient, economical, and cheapest way to reach out to your customer is from within your product. So, building out mechanisms to be able to reach out to your pro to your existing customers or even prospects who are trying out your product from within net um, is critical. And this is something that you know again I've gathered from marketing. Um, every time I come out, and the most important thing over here, every time we are planning a new product or a new product release. The key thing that we look at is whether we have a viable GTM go-to-market for 
um, for this product um, or for this particular update. Now, we might, as a PM, we might come up with plans for addressing this new um, opportunity, which is in uh, adjacent um, market segment um, or uh, for in an adjacent um, vertical or in, a, or in a new geo, et cetera. But you need to think about, you know, how are you going to reach that market segment? Is there a viable um, economical way to reach that market segment. Um, you know, uh, for example, if you've decided that you want to enter the healthcare industry with um, e-learning, um, which is what you know something that we do. Again, you need to figure out whether there's a viable way to reach those healthcare professionals. You know, uh, where do the healthcare professionals hang out? What conferences do they go for? What um, you know news articles do they read is that um, you know what what's the cost of you know google adwords to reach them those are things that you would look at before figuring out whether you want to even enter that market so again something that i've gained from uh, working with marketing and driving those functions are starting to think of um, a viable gtm upfront and keeping that um, up and center when making a business case. And even further beyond that, um, working with marketing and sales together. So while managing sales, the, the key things that, you know, um, you need to be aware of are, you know, what's your lead flow like? You know, if if your sales team is not functioning, um, is is it because of, you know, I mean, where is the choke happening? Is it because, um, you know, the number of leads that they are getting have reduced? Is it because the quality of leads have fallen? Um, is that something that you can do about it? And being able to have those meaningful discussions um, with marketing in terms of, you know, what can we do to address um, things like lead flow, things like um, um, the lead quality, et cetera. Um, if our... Um, you know, average order value is falling? Is it because we are not able to reach the high value customers? Is it because we are only reaching the, um, let's say the SMB segments with our messaging? Those are things that you look at and, you know, you figure out what needs to be tweaked, what needs to be updated. So um, again, the key insights that, um, um, I've got from across these functions, like, um, you know, Amit um, had a question on, was about how, you know, how, how do I use this overall um, um, holistic awareness of what's happening across the business to plan out uh, my product offering? And when we are doing this, how do I, um, you know, how, how do I structure my entire business to address both um, both these short-term and long-term goals? So that really is about, um, you know, how, and I mean, that's really helped me first become a better PM and business owner overall, and really, um, help me understand the challenges of, you know, um, um, moving from a PM to a GM and the functions that you would um, have to balance out when um, you're making those decisions. So, um, like I said, I really think in this whole context, the um, the 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 challenge is about balancing the short term versus the um, long term um, asks. And um, that's where uh, GM um, excels in being able to um, in being able to address the short term asks without losing sight of the medium to long term vision that is potentially going to drive your exponential growth story for you. Um, so 
that with that i come to the end of my um, presentation if there's any questions i can take them uh, there's another one um, by amit so wanted to say okay pm needs customer feedback which is done by deep questions by pm now with sales available to you does sales slash customer facing team feedback is refined slash usable to pm or has to be done in old way no i've found a lot of so i mean that's that's a big thing that i found useful i mean like you know all good pms know you should be spending most of your time with your customers right i mean outside with your customers understanding what their challenges are and how they are adopting a product how they are working with it etc these two functions which are you know super customer facing functions both sales and customer success and support these working with them has meant that you know you have direct insights on um on your customers you know what is working in your product in terms of how your product has been packaged and how your product has been positioned when you're with your sales team you know whether the customer is willing to open his purse strings and you know give you the money for that particular product um you know exactly what type of customer is willing to purchase the product and for what use cases they're willing to purchase the product for right the, the use cases might not be immediately um visible in the sales function but the way we manage sales over here in in our uh, bu is we use a value selling approach so this is where we basically um first try and identify what the business objectives are for the customer we try and identify what the business needs are what the personal wins are for the person trying to purchase this um and then we see whether we have you know significant meaningful differentiators compared to competition that we can position so we keep asking questions to understand their customer needs in detail so that you know most in the first level most of the customer needs would be the same right um somebody wants a learning management system somebody wants um you know it to be a hosted learning management system or somebody wants a web conferencing system yes but you need to be able to dig in deeper and deeper and that's what we've inculcated into the sales team that's the value selling approach to understand what are their more fine grain needs right i mean so it could be that i need um a learning management system but i really need this to drive um to to drive customer education to to help my customers adopt my product better and i'm trying to educate my customers and that's why i need this and for that i need to be able to um deliver learning in small snippets to um in the areas or in in the portals that the customer visits and that is what i need so you would get those details only if you keep asking questions um more and more questions and that's what the sales team is trained to do and as they ask those questions we finally get to the specific needs where we as a product have meaningful differentiators to competition and then we can position those meaningful differentiators to address those specific needs and that's how we you know basically win the account rather than having to compete over price so that gives me great insights into what the customers needs are that i can you know i mean doing that process multiple times over and over gives me great insights into what my typical customers needs are where are they willing to pay us how it's packaged whether our packaging is working whether our features are working etc that i can bring back to my you know pm hat and see what i can do in terms of rolling out the next version of the product or you know iterating on my product similarly on a csm front customer success um you know managing the customer success teams and support teams i know how my product is being used now that someone's purchased it i know how difficult it's it is to adopt that product how quickly are they able to adopt the product how quickly are they able to adopt it in depth what are the areas that they're struggling in what do i need to work on to enhance those 
what are the use cases that they are using it for you know are that are they the same use cases that i had envisioned or are they using it for something different are they using it a little different you know a little differently from what i thought people would be using it on and should i focus on that should i you know try and build my product out for that so those are all insights that i get directly from customers you know unlike traditional um customer interviews and surveys i'm actually getting these insights in a much more meaningful manner any other questions uh, the other question is by kumar he's asking uh, tell me how you overcome product failures challenges or poor feedback so um um clearly i mean in these years there have been several instances where we've received um you know poor feedback from customers there have been instances where our systems have gone down there have been challenges we had to address um so what we um again so what generally happens and especially in this function is that then these short term functions they will pounds on you when there is any feedback that comes in like this right i mean first it, it will start with support and customer success and um you know it will quickly get escalated from support to customer success and then you know even further from there to sales um so all of them are going to be bagging on you and if you are the business owner if you are the gm you need to make the decision on terms of what can we do to address this poor feedback that's coming in um and like i said what we've tried to do is we've set expectations that we will iterate quickly um our customers know that so the customer our customers recognize us as someone who is super responsive um to understanding the customers needs and um we've actually structured our customer success team such that they really are customer advocates they you know they are trusted advisors they are trusted partners of the particular customer so when they so the customer really looks up to them to help address these things so when these issues come up we we really see whether um you know what's the quickest that we can iterate on this and like i said we've sort of planned for it um you know seeing how this panned out we've taken our resources and we've said that we can't have all our resources focus on just the medium to long term vision from the pm we would need to you know continuously iterate and part of that is having a section of our resources that's just focused on doing customer enhancement requests and bug fixes so mm-hmm. those things get addressed in a meaningful manner all right thanks shamir the next question is by nitin he's asking what is practice followed in hiring product managers hiring from outside or growing internally uh so i think it's a little bit of both but mainly we do hire from outside um again um hiring internally um I, i mean for me and i guess it's different across different uh you know areas in adobe but in our business unit um at least the belief is that um you know there is a certain skill set that a pm brings in terms of having this well rounded vision of the business and that generally is missing if you've only been um you know playing one of those functions be it only being playing a sales function or only being playing a engineering function etc so that part would be missing and so i think that's the biggest issue in terms of um um sorry uh that's the biggest issue in terms of um uh hiring from inside 
All right. In continuation with the same question, Priyank is asking, uh, how important are domain skills when hiring product manager? Again, um, I can only speak to from uh, my BU perspective and my own personal experience. From my own um, experience and from you know having worked with um, my counterparts and my team of product managers here, I wouldn't think that domain expertise would be a limitation in in me hiring a PM. Um, for me, a person who has the product management skills is a lot more important and possibly sufficient than someone with uh, necessarily having the domain expertise in that particular domain. Yes, if I get a person who has the requisite PM skills and also has the domain expertise, I would you know, possibly pick that person, but domain expertise wouldn't be a necessary uh, requirement. All right, thanks, Shamit. The next question is by Namrata. She's asking, how do you decide what not to build? <laughs> Seems like a PM interview question, but yes. Uh, again, um, it we are always making those decisions, right? I mean, I think it's more, we're spending more time a lot more time, uh, um, you know, uh, figuring out what is it that we are not going to build than what is it that we want to build. Because the stuff that we want to build is huge. Um, again, like I said, the way we've structured, their ideas are dime a dozen. And, you know, the customer ERs that are coming in are, again, by the sack load. So we always have enough things that, you know, we can potentially start working on, but the, the the most amount of time is spent on figuring out what is it that you're not going to build. And that decision really is made based on um, figuring out what these things that I spoke of. I mean, what's going to be the business impact of building this out um, for me? I would look at everything from, you know, um, if I build this out, can I meaningfully package and market it um you know would i would it imp which of my channels um which of my SKUs, which of my gtms would it impact the most you know so based on that what's my what's the business impact going to be um of that whole thing and then you make the shortlist and you make a decision to whether you want to build that or not um again if it's a build versus buy decision in our realm, more often than not, if we can buy, I always favor buying because if it's available, I'd rather just pick it up from the market, get an SI, get a partner to offer that with rather than build it out because I know that our skill set is is unique and premium and I'd rather use that to build out those differentiated features. All right. Uh, another question is: Any framework you recommend to decide what to build ourselves, buy off the shelf, outsource? Again, so like I said, if anything can be um, bought off the shelf or outsourced, more often than not, I lean towards getting it in that manner. Um, if it's integral to our product and if you know in the future it's something that we would have to continuously manage and maintain then that's the time where i would shy away from that decision and look at building it myself all right um Picasso is asking uh, is there any book that you would recommend to read to get product management insights my favorite is Lean Startup by Eric Rice. All right, Shamir. Um, any more uh, questions from the audience? We have some more time, like a few more minutes.
um, any certification for product managers? A question by Priyank. Not that I'm aware of, sorry. I'm sure it is there. Um, I mean, we have the Product Management Institute, etc. But um, not that I'm um, really aware of, no. All right. What is the must and again, have? I truly think product management is not a function that you can learn in a school. So I'm really from that school of thought. So yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, Ankita. One. Anything else? All right. Uh, another question by Namrata. She's saying, what is the must have skill for a product manager? must have skills um so some of the main skills that we look for is someone who can see the big picture someone who can really empathize with the customer's needs be able to you know make a strong um, obviously identify the right opportunities and make a complete business case to manage stakeholder expectations across. Those are the things that I would look for in a PM. All right, uh, there's one question by Siddharth. He's asking, how important is technical knowledge for a product manager? What's the fine balance? I think technical knowledge is important, but, um, you know, technical knowledge wouldn't like we discussed about you know domain expertise that wouldn't be my primary factor for uh hiring a pm but um i think technical knowledge is important for you to be able to have the right conversations to, especially in stakeholder management that's a big place where i see you know technical knowledge being important All right, there's another question, uh, which is now you are a GM moved from PM in perspective, who has more influence on the future of product? Who has more influence on the future? Clearly the PM has the most influence on the future of the product. I mean, the PM is responsible for the medium to long term uh, roadmap of the product and it is the PM who should be held responsible for it and, you know, um, if they don't meet their objectives. All right. Any other questions? Uh, we have um, five more minutes, audience. This one is there any reason MBA is preferred for PM role? Well, an MBA helps you understand. Like I said, I mean, I think uh, the whole gist of my presentation was how a PM needs to have a holistic view in order to be able to make the right uh, business decisions. And an MBA really helps you get that holistic view. You know, I mean, it helps you understand the sales functions. It helps you understand the marketing functions. It helps you, you know, have those conversations with those teams better. I mean, that's that's really what I gathered from my MBA. And that's how it's helped me. All right. Any other questions, folks? Uh, what is the maturity in terms of roles for a PM? Mm. Maturity in terms of, I'm not sure I understood the question. Sorry. Alicia, can you um, elaborate your question a bit? Uh, there's one more question by SK who's asking, who is the owner of what feature list goes in the product? Clearly the PM, I think the 
uh, I mean, surely the PM is responsible for prioritizing the features for each update. Um, you know, anything that goes into the product, the PM is responsible for prioritizing it. And like we've done here, I think a good uh, practice would be to start segregating your resources to figure out what's needed to meet your long-term versus short-term goals. But a PM clearly has the final say in what features make the cut. All right. Uh, what Alicia has asked before, uh, uh, Shamir, uh, she was saying, uh, what is the maturity in terms of roles for a PM now? She's also writing the roles a PM fills in in the years in an organization. So, yeah, I mean, I think if you're referring to how does the PM role grow out, then that's, um, I mean, that's what I was trying to address with this presentation. I mean, that was a conundrum for me in the beginning too, right? I mean, I joined as a PM in, in July systems in my, in my prior company. And then I've played this, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm the longest serving PM at Adobe India, at least. Um, so it's been a question on, okay, that do you grow out as a PM? And I think, I mean, what I've seen now is that a PM eventually should look to aim to grow into a, um, a GM, a business owner and a GM. And that's where um, you grow into. Um, as you start getting a hang of all the functions, I think that's where you should aim to grow into. All right, um, last question, anyone? All right. Um, I think um, we are done with the Q&A round. So um, first of all, thank you so much, Shamir, for presenting. It was a great session to listen to and learn something new and uh, valuable. Um, and for the audience, I would want to tell all of you that I will be back with another intriguing episode from the GDM series on the topic expanding field operations to US experiences from the trenches by Vishal Gupta, CEO Seclure, on 2nd of July. For more info and register, please visit nascom.in slash events. Thank you so much, Shermir, for your time and efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Ankita. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.